All right, if you've not opened your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 16, please do so. We are going to be in verses 1 through 18, as Jen read for us. And when you think about this, church, it's kind of amazing that that is the symbol of our community. I mean, you think about what a cross is. I mean, a cross is an instrument of torture and humiliation and execution. And yet, we put crosses on everything. We put crosses on church buildings. We put them in stained glass windows. We put them on jewelry. We put them on t-shirts. Some of us even have them tattooed on our bodies. Some of you, your opinion of me just went down. Some of you think I've never been cooler. (laughs) But there's this sense where we celebrate this image. We we, we exalt this image. We, We identify with this image of the cross. And in some ways, it's crazy because, again, it's an It's it's an image of execution and torture and shame and humiliation, but it's also very appropriate. It's very appropriate that the church, the people of God, would be identified with the cross because it is also a symbol of humility, of dying to self, of being willing to suffer. And this is what Jesus said we must do and who we must be if we're going to follow him. So we are down to our final chapter in 1 Corinthians, and we have two messages left this week and next week, and we've covered a lot of ground. I mean, if you've been with us for any amount of time in 1 Corinthians, you know we have covered a lot of ground, a lot of issues, a lot of varying conflicts and theological issues that the Apostle Paul has addressed in this letter. But if we were to boil down everything the Apostle Paul has said, If we were to boil down all the problems that the Corinthians were facing and all the problems they were creating, well, we could boil things down to a contrast of this, the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the cross. See, all of the problems the Corinthians had, all of their sin, all of their wonky theology, all the ways that they were standing up in pride and arrogance and misusing and abusing one another, all their issues could be boiled down to this, that they love the wisdom of the world more than the wisdom of the cross. And the Apostle Paul's counsel to them, his teaching to them, his challenge to them, could be boiled down to this. The wisdom of the cross is greater than the wisdom of the world. And so at the heart of 1 Corinthians is this contrast, is this battle. Are we going to be people who follow the wisdom of the cross, or are we going to be shaped by the wisdom of of the world. And here, even in chapter 16, Paul is not done with this. So as, as you would read in most letters of this time, and even letters that we write today, sort of the ending can be this hodgepodge of things, where you kind of sort of address all the personal and business items you haven't addressed yet. And that's what we get in chapter 16. Paul covers a lot of different ground. He talks about collecting money for a church in need. He talks about travel plans. He talks about honoring different leaders, expresses um, some final exhortation about being strong and courageous and how much he loves them. He, he's, he's kind of all over the place. But in the midst of all that hodgepodge, he is still pastoring. He's still teaching. He's still driving home this point about the importance of the wisdom of the cross and what it means to be a people shaped by the wisdom of the cross. So what does it mean to be a church submitted to the wisdom of the cross? What does this look like? What what does a church who is shaped by the wisdom of the cross value? What kinds of things do they do? If you were to look at the life of that church and you were to say, oh, they're shaped by the cross, how would you know that? Well, Well, in some ways, we've been answering that question throughout this entire series. But in 1 Corinthians 16, this first part, we're going to again sort of get a glimpse at some particular characteristics of a church characterized by wisdom, the wisdom of the cross. And so the title of my message this morning is this, Faithfulness Over Flash. And here's the main point for us from this passage. The wisdom of the cross leads to generous faithfulness. The wisdom of the cross leads to generous faithfulness, meaning to be shaped by the wisdom of the cross is to value and honor and practice generosity, sacrifice, and faithfulness over and above seeking comfort, pleasure, entertainment, status, power, and recognition. 
This is underneath all that the Apostle Paul is going to share, is going to teach us this morning. God's word is going to teach us. And so may God, by his word and his spirit, shape us in this truth. So let's look at how at the beginning of chapter 16, Paul calls the church of Corinth to generosity. Here's what he writes. Now about the collection for the saints, do the same as I instructed the Galatian churches. On the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering so that no collection will need to be made when I come. When I arrive, I will send with letters those you recommend to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it is suitable for me to go as well, they will travel with me. So let me give you a little background here on what Paul is saying, what he's talking about. When the Jerusalem church sent Paul and Barnabas out to to take the gospel to the Gentiles, meaning non-Jews, and to plant churches throughout the Gentile world, they, they tasked them with this. Hey, as you plant churches and make disciples, We want you to create a network of support with those churches and the church in Jerusalem. See, the church in Jerusalem was quite large when you read in the book of Acts. Thousands and thousands of people. And a lot of those people were poor. And so the church had a, in Jerusalem, had a tremendous responsibility for caring for the poor among its members. And that put a financial strain on the church. And so when Paul went out to plant churches and make disciples... Well, what he did is he established a relationship between these churches and said, hey, your Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ are in need. And as you have been blessed, you also give to help those brothers and sisters in need. And so we see this in multiple places in the letters of Paul, this encouragement to give towards the needs in Jerusalem. And so he was creating this network of support. And and for the Corinthians part, As Paul writes in verse 2, each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering. So at the beginning of each week, when they would gather for worship, they were to take up a collection and they were to take up a a money they could set aside that that would eventually go to the church in Jerusalem. And what Paul writes in verse 2, how he sort of frames this out is he says, in keeping with how someone is prospering, in other words, in accordance with how you have been blessed, be generous. To the degree that you have been blessed financially, be generous with others. To whom much is given, much is required, in other words. Financial blessing and prosperity should provoke a deeper desire for you to be generous. So so Paul is calling on those who have been blessed, who have much, to have a heart of generosity towards those who have little. And look, friends, in our culture, this this happens in many ways backwards. Like financial prosperity so often provokes in us a desire for more. Well, I've gotten some success. Let me get some more success. I've, I've gained some wealth. Let me get more wealth. I've gained a measure of comfort and pleasure. Let me get more comfort and pleasure. So we see money and financial prosperity as a means to more and more and more for me. Wow, look how much I got. Let's get some more. And maybe we shower some blessings with people, but at the end of the day, what is it about? It's about getting more and more and more and consuming more and more and more. And this is what our culture teaches us. This is how our culture teaches us to respond to financial prosperity and blessing. The Apostle Paul flips this on its head. He says, to the degree to which you have been blessed, to the degree which you have been able to get more, give it away. The more you get, the more you should give. And in many ways, this matches completely what he has been teaching through the entire book of 1 Corinthians. And if we go back to chapters 8 and 9, what was the the main point in those chapters? That we lay down our rights and our comforts for others. And, And so friends, listen, do you have a right to your money? Absolutely. Like you've earned it. If you've worked hard for it and you earned it, yes, you have a right to that money. We're not talking about communism here and letting the government take everything. However, If all you live for is so that you can get more and more for yourself, how small and how sad and even how callous. Like if you look and you see the needs of other people, especially brothers and sisters in Christ, and you sort of just shrug and you callously walk by or you close your fist and you say, no, I earn this, this is mine as they go in need. Friends, that is not the wisdom of the cross. And similarly, in chapters 12 through 14, 
What did we learn there? Your gifting and ability are not to build self, but for the good of others. Like there is so much gifting in this room. There's so much gifting in First City Church. So many abilities, so much talent. And some of you, God has given a spiritual gift of making money. Like you're just good at it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's incredible that God blesses certain people and they can take $1 and make $100. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift. But if you think that gift, that ability, that talent is just so you can get more and consume more, that's not the wisdom of the cross. That is not what Jesus has called you to. That gifting is not about just serving self, but how you can bless and give up others. And so all throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul has been driving home this principle of the wisdom of the cross, generosity towards others, giving of yourself for others. The wisdom of the cross says, the greatest and most glorious thing you can do is not get, but give. The greatest and most glorious thing is not to consume and to just build a nest egg for yourself, but rather to exercise radical grace and generosity so that you can care for others. So several years after he wrote his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote a second letter. And in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is again calling them to generosity. Uh, it, it seems from the book of 2 Corinthians that the Corinthians started off with generous hearts towards the church in Jerusalem. They, they set aside quite a bit of money. They were eager. There was, a, there, there was a sort of a proactive stance that they had. But eventually, that sort of waned. And so Paul had to once again provoke them and encourage them to be generous. And here's what he writes in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, verses 7 through 11. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this act of grace. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich for your sake, he became poor, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. And in this matter, I am giving advice because it is profitable for you who began last year not only to do something, but also to want to do it. Now also finish the task so that just as there was an eager desire, there may also be a completion according to what you have. Corinthians, you have so much. You excel in so much. You excel in faith. You have great faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You excel in speech. You're eloquent when you articulate the gospel. You are knowledgeable. You know a lot of theology. You excel in these things. And just as you excel in that, now excel in this grace, generosity, giving of your resources, giving of yourself. You, you wanted to do it. You had the desire to do it. Now follow through. Be faithful. Complete the task. And notice what Paul says in verse 9. Here's the heart of the motivation. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich for your sake, he became poor, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. What compels generous faithfulness? Well, what is gonna get us up every morning so that we are motivated by generous faithfulness? Well, it's looking to the wisdom of the cross. It's looking to Jesus himself, who though he was rich, rich in glory, in power, in majesty, in authority. Though he was rich and he had all the glories of heaven, what did he do? He didn't hold on to his rights. He didn't hold on to his high and lofty position. No, he laid down his rights. He stepped from his high and glorious and lofty position and he took on the form of a lowly servant. He took on our frail humanity. And he entered into our sickness and our suffering and our sin. He didn't keep it at an arm's distance. He didn't remove himself from it. No, he entered into it up close and personal. And you know, if you think about it, the glorious son of God, God incarnate, stepping from the glories of heaven and putting on the frailty of humanity and entering into our mess and our muck and our sin, that alone would have been incredibly generous. Like just to have God come down in that way and meet us and love us and care for us, 
That would have been generous. But Jesus doesn't stop there, does he? No, he gets lower. He becomes even more poor. He, he doesn't just leave his lofty and glorious position. He doesn't just lay down his mm -hmm. rights. No, he lays down his very life. He lays down his life as a payment for your sin and mine. He allows himself to be strung up on a Roman cross as a despised and shameful criminal. And on that cross, Jesus took all of our judgment for our sin. He took the wrath of God that you and I deserve. That's how low our Savior went. That's how poor he became. That's how generous his faithfulness is. And friends, here's the good news of the gospel, that in that, in Christ's poverty, in him going that low, that poor, you and I become rich. Like you and I get to experience full forgiveness and freedom and life in Christ. We get to be welcomed in and loved as a beloved son or daughter. We get resurrection life. God has lavished all the riches of his grace on us in Jesus Christ. Friends, this didn't happen because Jesus stayed in heaven. This didn't happen because Jesus held on to his rights. No, this happened because Jesus was generously faithful. That Jesus was willing to become poor and give of himself so that you and I could be rich. And so when we look to the wisdom of the cross, when we look to Christ himself, what do we see? That giving, giving of ourselves, giving of our time and our resources, that is the most glorious thing we can do. Not consuming, not building comfort and success and status and pleasure here, but giving. When we look to the wisdom of the cross, we see that when we lay down our lives for others, then when we use our time and our talents and our resources that God has blessed us with to build others up, that is life. That is glorious because that is what Jesus did for us. That is what our God has done for us. And don't miss this. He did it for you when you didn't deserve it. Like, friends, think about this for a second. I want you to think for just a moment, and hopefully it's nobody in the room, who is the most annoying person to you? Like someone that you're like, I just do not want to give this person grace. Like they are, maybe they're arrogant, maybe they're lazy, maybe they're just so selfish and self-absorbed, and they've blown chance after chance after chance, they've abused grace after grace after grace. They're just for themselves all the time, they make excuses, they blame other people, they're just hard to be around, and they keep messing up, and every time they come around, you're just like, no, I'm done with you. I, I just wish you would go away. I want to just put you over here because you bug me so much and annoy me so much. And you've abused so many people's grace and chances that really you shouldn't get another chance. You should just sort of be over here by yourself because that's what you deserve. You know those kind of people. You don't want to be honest that you have those kind of people, but you do. Come on, we all do. Friends, do you know that's you? Like, like, that is you before God. Like, that is you before God. I don't care how diligent and how um, responsible you are and how much you have tried to build a good life and treat people with decency and respect. Like, apart from Christ, you are rebellious, arrogant, self-centered, self-absorbed, living for your own kingdom, building your own kingdom here in rebellion against God, and you have abused grace after grace after grace after grace, chance after chance after chance after chance, you don't deserve generous faithfulness. None of us do. I don't. And if you're honest about that, you know that. You know that. So we are those people. But, but, it is when we were that type of person, annoying, not worthy of grace, not worthy of being rescued and redeemed, it is when we were that type of person when Jesus came for us. It's when we're that kind of person that Jesus stepped from the glories of heaven and became poor for us so that we could become rich. When we didn't deserve grace, God lavished his grace on us. When we didn't deserve generous faithfulness, God was faithful to the utmost. Jesus came for us while we were still sinners. That's how generous, that's how faithful our God is. None of us deserve this. None of us have earned this. No, we've earned judgment. 
We've earned being written off. But God is faithful. He is good. Jesus is faithful. He is good. And in their goodness and in their glory, they saved us, came after us. And so friends, if this is who our God is, like if our God is this generous, this faithful, if Jesus was willing to become poor so that we become rich, should it not be that our lives and our hearts are shaped by the same kind of generous faithfulness? If, if the cross is what represents the, gracious, the graciousness of God, the generous faithfulness of God, should we not be people of the cross, shaped by the cross? So the question for us this morning, for you and for me and for us as a church, are we shaped by the wisdom of the cross or the wisdom of the world? Like, do we believe, do we believe that wisdom comes in, hey, let's chase after every comfort and every pleasure and status and success and recognition and self-made identity? Are we listening to the wisdom of the world that says, go after those things, go after those things? Are we listening to the wisdom of the cross that says, lay down your life, sacrifice, serve, give so that others may be built up in Christ? Not get, but give. Is that the wisdom that is shaping you and I? Now, let me be very clear about something. I don't want you to mistake what I'm saying and not saying. If what you hear me saying right now and what you've heard me been saying the past 10 minutes is give more money to the church, you're missing the point. Now look, does scripture teach that Christians are called to be faithful with our money? Absolutely. Scripture teaches that if we, we should be committed to a local church, and in that commitment we give financially for the ministry of that church, church is a family, and you are committed to your family, you support your family, and so absolutely, Christ calls us to give of our resources. Our bank account should ring loud and clear, generosity, generous faithfulness, absolutely. And maybe this morning, part of the application, the way the Spirit is convicting you is in the area of finances. However, this is so much bigger than that. And, and, and I'm sorry if, if you have had bad experiences in the past with the church where any talk of generosity immediately was a guilt trip into giving you more money to the church. That's not what this is about. No, this is about being shaped by the wisdom of the cross where our entire lives are given with this posture of generous faithfulness. And so, yeah, that probably includes your bank accounts. But understand, you could give 10%, you could give 20%, you could give 50%, I don't care how big the percent is, and still not be shaped by the wisdom of the cross. Like it is possible to sort of lock this down financially and go, look, I'm good, check the box, but your entire life screams, I'm not generous. Friends, the wisdom of the cross calls us to a generous faithfulness in all aspects of life, an entirety of life. It teaches us to reject this notion that I need to give all of my time and talent and energy and trying to build comfort and security in a kingdom here on this earth. It teaches me to reject the notion that my identity is in my achievements, and so I have to keep achieving more and more and more to get more status and be more and more of in other people's eyes. No, the wisdom of the cross sets us free from all of that. It sets us free so that now we can let go of our stuff. If my hope is in Jesus, my hope is in the kingdom of God, I can let go of this stuff because this isn't my treasure, this isn't my inheritance, and I can give. And I can give financially to where other people have needs, and I can support ministry, and I can, I can use the blessing of my resources to help others, yes. But here's what else. I'm also releasing my time and my talent, my very self. I'm not tight-fisted with my time. I'm not tight-fisted with myself. I'm not tight-fisted with the skills and the resources that God has blessed me with. No, I give. I give. And I can give because my hope is in Christ. My inheritance is in Christ. I have the hope of resurrection, the hope of a new cosmos renewed by Christ when he returns. That's my inheritance. That's my glory. If that's the case, this is just stuff that I can give away. And my very being, I can give that away because my inheritance, my home, my hope is an eternal glory. That's what this means, church. That's what this is about. 
Yeah, the Apostle Paul is specifically calling them to be generous financially, but it's so much bigger than that. So much more than that. The wisdom of the cross is a call for all of us to have this generosity. It's to have this posture where we are, there's a sense where yes just sort of rings from our, our being. There's this anecdotal story of President Thomas Jefferson, and maybe some of you have heard the story. He was riding with a number of men, and they, they came up to this river crossing, and there was a guy, not on a horse, just sort of standing on the river, kind of looking across. And he turns around, and he sees Jefferson with a number of guys on horses, and he looks at President Jefferson, and he goes, hey, can I get a ride on your horse across the river? And Jefferson's like, yeah, come on up. Takes him over, hops off the horse, and one of the guys that's with Jefferson, he goes, do you know who that was? He's like, no. He goes, that, that's the president. Why, why did you ask the president of the United States to give you a ride and not one of us? He's like, well, I looked at all your faces and they all said no. His said yes. <laughs> what would it mean, church, to have a yes sort of air about us? That our hope in Christ is so great. Our, our treasure in Christ is so great. We've been so shaped by the wisdom of the cross that we're not, people don't experience this as stingy and no people, but yes people. Now, this doesn't mean that you run and save every single person that you can. It doesn't mean that you enter into every single mess and try to rescue every person. That's not healthy. But is the posture of your heart, is the, the atmosphere of this church is our community defined, when people experience this, they experience the sense of yes. These are people who will give. These are people who will open up their checkbook, open up their time, their calendar, open up their very lives, their homes to us to care for people, to love people, to serve people, to sacrifice for people. And you never have to twist anybody's arm. Friends, you know, God didn't have to be convinced to send Jesus. God's not stingy with grace. Christ didn't have to be talked into coming and dying for us. No, he did it willingly and freely. Our God is a God that says, yes, our God is a God who is generous and open-handed with his grace and with his faithfulness. If that is who our God is, let us be that kind of people. Let us be shaped by the wisdom of the cross. Now, if we are going to be that kind of people, people who are generous in their faithfulness, then we are also have to be those who honor faithfulness. In verses five through nine, Paul tells the Corinthians of his extended travel plans. He's saying, hey, I hope to be able to come to you soon and be able to spend some time with you. But as he writes in verses 10 and 11, in the meantime, if Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear while with you because he's doing the Lord's work just as I am. So let no one look down on him. Send him on his way in peace so that he can come to me because I am expecting him with the brothers. Now, Timothy, if you're not familiar with who Timothy was, he was a young leader and protege of Paul who traveled with him on his missionary journeys. Uh, Paul, uh, Timothy was with Paul when he went to Corinth and planted this church in Corinth. And so Timothy was familiar with this church. They knew Timothy. Timothy would eventually become the lead pastor of the church in Ephesus. So they know Timothy. They know who he is. They have a relationship with him. But Paul has some concerns about when Timothy visits the Corinthians and how they would treat them. Why? What's his concern for how the Corinthians would treat Timothy? Well, if you go a few verses later, you also read that Paul had strongly encouraged Apollos to go to Corinth, but Apollos was like, can't right now. Can't make it happen. Maybe some other time. So the Corinthians were expecting Apollos. They were hoping for Apollos. And they loved Apollos. Like you go back to 1 Corinthians 1, there was actually cliques surrounding Apollos. Like, I'm for Apollos, I'm for Paul, I'm for Peter, I'm for Jesus. So they loved Apollos. Apollos was a well-known, well-loved teacher in the early church. So they were expecting him, hoping him for him, because you know, you get Apollos, their status with that. He's the, he's the cool, he's the rock star, he's the celebrity preacher. So they're hoping for him, but they're probably going to get Timothy. Like, like they want the celebrity. They want the guy who's been arguing with the Jews and has this reputation of this great debater and preacher and teacher. They want that guy, but they're probably going to get Timothy. You know, Timothy's great and all, 
but he's not Apollos. Yeah, 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 we like Timothy. He, he, he can preach a good sermon once in a while. He's a nice guy, but man, we want Apollos. Give us Apollos. And so Paul has to remind them, hey, when Timothy comes, don't, don't, don't let him fear that you are not going to show him hospitality. Don't let him fear that you are going to look down on him. No, show him hospitality. Welcome him. Take care of his every need. Don't look down on him. Why? Notice what Paul says. Because he's doing the Lord's work just like me. Timothy is a faithful brother, and that's all that matters. He's doing the Lord's work. He is serving the Lord. He is on these missionary journeys with me. He has poured out his life for that those may, others may know Christ. He's given his time and his life to you as well. He's a faithful brother, and that is what matters. Honor him because he's faithful. This is a similar point that Paul makes a few verses later, where he writes on verses 15 through 18, Brothers and sisters, you know the household of Stephanus. They are the first fruits of Achaia and have devoted themselves to serving the saints. I urge you also to submit to such people and to everyone who works and labors with them. I'm delighted to have Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus present because these men have made up for your absence, for they have refreshed my spirit in yours. Therefore, recognize such people. So Paul highlights this household of Stephanus, who was, and, and his household was some of the first converts in Achaia, which is the region that Corinth is in. And, he, and so he says, honor the, these people. Why? Because they have faithfully devoted themselves to serving the saints. They, they serve. They're faithful. And when you see faithful leaders, you should honor them. Nothing to do with their status, nothing to do with their prestige, nothing to do with their talent. Are they faithful? Are they devoted to you? Do they love you? Do, do they pour out their lives and give of the very selves for you? If the answer is yes, honor them. Submit to them. Follow them. These are the people that we should be upholding and honoring and celebrating, the ones who are faithful. Friends, sadly, this is not the case in the church. If I can confess here for a second, um, I have this bad habit of doom scrolling. You guys know what doom scrolling is, where you kind of flip through social media to find bad news? Um, I have this really bad habit of doing that, looking for stories of pastors who have fallen. It's a terrible habit. It's bad for my soul. I'm giving it up. Hopefully sabbatical will break me of that habit. But, but this is what I do sometimes. And here's what, I've, well, what I can tell you. It's common through every single story. To a T. Very gifted. Very successful. Not faithful. And the success and the gifting and the charisma and all of that was so much that they overlooked the fact that the guy wasn't faithful. And so story after story after story, here's what happens. An exaltation of gifting, an exaltation of personality, an exaltation of success, minimizing faithfulness. And every single time that comes back to bite the church, hurts the church, and there are so many saints who are wounded and hurt and even taken out of the church at times because of this. And yet it keeps happening. Friends, the last example of that didn't happen just yesterday. It will keep happening because we have an attraction to this stuff. Like we have been so shaped by the wisdom of the world rather than the wisdom of the cross that we've been conditioned to look for personality and talent and success and platform and go, that's, that's something. That must be the thing. That's where the spirit is. I want to get behind that. We begin to minimize faithfulness. There's something in us that likes to be attached to that. Makes us feel stronger, or makes us feel like we're a part of something bigger. I don't know what it is, but there's something in us that is far too attracted to that. But then when you look at the average boring dude who maybe he's not the greatest speaker, maybe not the greatest leader, but he's just faithful year after year after year to love and pour himself out, that's sort of just like, oh yeah, yeah, that guy. When that should be, no, that guy. Yes, that guy. Celebrate and honor that. That should be the thing that we look for and, and respect and honor and celebrate the most faithfulness. 
I think there's also something in us, I know this is in me, where we look at that status and success and gifting and like, I really want that. I wish that were me. I mean, again, let's, let's have a moment of honesty. Hopefully you didn't lie about having that list of per- people. Here's a chance to make up for that by being honest. Would you rather be super gifted with recognition, success and status, but have these massive gaps in character, or would you rather be kind of boring and average and kind of moderate success or little success or something no one even pays attention to, but be faithful and have Christ-like character? Come on. Come on. We, we know that there's a part of us that like, yeah, I, I think I would like the success and the status and the gifting. I, I'd like to be that good and have that recognition. Yeah, gaps in character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just won't make the same mistakes. Yeah, right. Um, so often, this is where we want to be. We're attracted to this. We make excuses. We make passes. And yet over here, the faithfulness, the laying down life, the wisdom of the cross, here Paul is saying, honor those people. Follow those people. That's the culture of the church, the, the, the culture that the, the church should be if it's shaped by the wisdom of the cross. That's what Paul, that's what God's word calls us to. Church, are we honoring that? Are we honoring faithfulness? Are we valuing faithfulness? Do we say, who are the faithful people? Let me follow and be like them. Let me look to them to learn and be discipled by. Church, let us build a culture where we honor faithfulness. So I want to encourage you to do something. Today, if you are able whether it's go up to them in this, after the service or if you're going to go up to meet them in person or shoot them a text or call them, find someone who you have said, this person's faithful. Maybe they're not the most talented. Maybe they're not the greatest leader or the most successful, but you look at them and you go, they're faithful. And go and say, hey, I just want you to know I've seen how faithful you've been and how faithful you continue to be, whether that's as a faithful husband, faithful Wife, faithful mom, dad, faithful in the church. Some area where you just observe this person is faithful. Day after day, week after week, year after year, and just say, hey, I noticed that. I just want to honor you. It's worth emulating. It's worth following. Keep, keep doing that. God sees. Other people see. I see, but I know God sees. What would it do, church? How would it change us? How would it shape us? If we were eager and regularly did that kind of thing, where we honored, celebrated, and encouraged faithfulness, and we exalted that above everything else, I think it would change a lot of things. Also for yourself. Hey, you may look at yourself and go, I'm not as talented as this person. I'm not as gifted as this person. I don't have as much knowledge as this person. I'm not as wise as this person. But here's what you do have. The Holy Spirit of God. And if the Holy Spirit of God is in you, you have everything you need to be faithful. Yeah, you might not have status, you might not have platform, you might not have this great worldly success, but who cares? What God honors is faithfulness. What God cares about is faithfulness. On that last day, is Jesus going to go, well done, my flashy and successful servant? No. Well done, my servant who had a giant platform with 5.5 million followers on social media. No. Well done, good and faithful servant. What does Jesus value? Faithfulness. What is the Spirit doing in you? Faithfulness. If you have the Spirit of God, you have everything you need to be faithful. So let me encourage you, be faithful. Look to the cross. Look to Christ. Follow him be shaped by him, just be faithful. Faithful as a husband, faithful as a mother, wife, dad, worker, servant in the church, whatever your vocation, whatever your role, be faithful. Be faithful. And know by the Spirit of God, God is at work, and he looks at your work, and he smiles. He honors it. He's pleased by it. Friends, this is what it means to be shaped by the wisdom of the cross. This is what it means to be shaped in generous faithfulness. And so, First City Church, let us be a people 
who practice generous faithfulness, sacrifice, service, giving of ourselves, our lives, our resources, our time, our talents, so that others may be built up in Christ. Let us be those who honor and celebrate faithfulness above everything else so that we push the worldly wisdom out of our system and not be attracted to those lies that the world wants to tell us. Let us be a culture that is shaped by the wisdom of the cross. Let us put our hope in the fact that yes, even when we blow it, Jesus is faithful. Look, Jesus died for your past selfishness. He died for the selfishness you're in right now, and he died for your future selfishness. But take hope. The Spirit is at work. Christ has forgiven that sin. No matter how unfaithful you have been, you can be faithful through the power of God. Take hold of that. Look to the wisdom of the cross, and let us, church, be generously faithful. Let's pray.